uh, it's nine o'clock, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started with whatever questions three of you have. Actually, one thing um, that somebody just pointed out to me that I'm going to have to email about later. But <coughs> Mistake on this uh, the pre-released exam questions. Um, this number um, should have said that you wanted to reach down to the right, not down to the left. Um, the rest of it doesn't quite make sense. Down to the left, um, where it's kind of like half. Makes sense. It's down to the right. Down to the right. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna like post. If you're gonna post. I send out a new thing. Bring fresh copies. Is it okay if we already did it? You should redo it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Okay. But we should redo it. Um, yeah, because other because later on it says why did we miss? And we yeah. actually don't really miss if you do it that way. So, um, so otherwise it's just not gonna the, the, the rest of the problem doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> so I will I'll post the revision and, and you can print that out and redo it and then um, also have fresh copies on the day of the exam. So, uh, sorry about that. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, questions? Do you have right now? Um, can you go for a maze theorem? Like, I'm, I'm just confused on how to do the maze theorem questions. Yeah, sure. Um, do you want to talk about it? Um, Like, do you understand it for the one case of like the are you sick situation? And it's just harder when there's like multiple possibilities. Or I think so. I'm just I'm having trouble like understanding it in relation to this. Like, in relation to that, yeah. yeah. Um, so for this problem here, um, so. Um, you have to do it for just for neuron A, since there's eight possible directions, you're going to have to do base theorem eight times. Um, so you're going to need to calculate, I can't remember what is, what is it? Um, neuron A is firing at four hertz. So you need to calculate the probability that the intended direction, that intended direction equals up, given that uh, firing rate under on A equals four hertz. And then you're gonna have to calculate the probability that the intended direction is up, uh, up left. Again, given that the firing rate under on A is four hertz. And then probability that the intended direction is left given this, so you have to do it eight times. So in the packet, when it just says intended direction is up, that means that the intended direction is up. It also means like given. Um, given. So yeah, yeah. So this is. Um, so so for example, um, oh actually, yeah 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah. So um, so the way you read this is um, so so one of the inputs that you're going to need. Uh, here is so what is the probability of firing rate on neuron A equals 4 hertz given that the intended direction is up. So that's one of that's part of part of solving this is you need to know that. And so to find that, <coughs> I'm gonna say probability of getting 4 hertz given that intended direction is up is 0.2. So when it says like P intended direction is up, <coughs> given, okay, gotcha, because it, yeah, it's so, oh, given that, okay, got it. I don't know what I just cut out, but yeah, um, so, so, yeah. so yeah, so here in this table, mm -hmm. this is giving you the, the firing rate um, on the, 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 the left side of the base, of, of, the, of, the, of the Bayesian term is on the rows, and the right side is on the columns. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, so let's.
Um, what would be? Yeah, let me see if I can quickly calculate something here. Um, it's okay, so let's go to the eighth times four plus one eighth times To do a different problem, it is to do some pre-calculation. Um, so 8 times 4, 8, 16, 32. So 1 over 32. Um, we have three of those. 3 over 32. 2, 3 of those. Plus 2. Yeah, I guess that does work out. Okay. Um, well, let's just, okay, so let's. Um, okay, so. Uh, two, sorry. Um, one over eight times two. Okay. So let's, we'll, we'll do a slightly different one. Um, so let's say that, the, that right now the neuron is firing at one hertz. So firing rate of neuron A equals one hertz. Um, one thing that we need to know is we need to know the, pro the overall probability of the firing rate. And I think if I did it right, it's 0 0.25. Um, I hope I did that right. Um, then, uh, so then we're going to do Bayes theorem eight times. And so we need to say up here, what's the probability that the intended direction is up? Given that, fire rate is one hertz. And to do that, I need to know the probability that the firing rate is one hertz if the intended direction were up, times the prior probability of up, divided by the prior probability and so I go over here to my table and it tells me that the probability of getting one hertz if the intended direction were up is zero so I have zero times one eighth divided by 0.25 equals zero so I'm one eighth of the way down then I say, okay, well, what's the probability of up left, given that the neuron's firing at one hertz? And so to figure that out, and to, what's the probability of getting one hertz if the intended direction were up left, times the overall prior probability of up left, divided by the overall prior probability of hertz, and so I go over here to my table, and with up left, it's also zero, and with left, it's also zero, so those get boring. Um, so we'll just erase those. Those are zeros and zeros and zeros. And then, um, okay, and then we get to one sort of interesting. We say, okay, what's the probability that the intended movement direction is down left? Given that I know my neuron is going one hertz, let's go do that. I need to know 
what's the probability that my neuron's going to go 1 hertz if the monkey really wants to go down left times the overall prior probability that the monkey would want to go down left divided by my overall prior probability of 1 hertz. So here's where I don't get a zero here. So the probability that my neuron is going to give me 1 hertz if the monkey wants to go down left is 0.25. And the, since there are eight directions, and I have no prior information about which one the monkey's going to prefer, the overall prior probability the monkey's going to want to go down left is 1 8th, or 0 0.125. And then I think I did this right. And the overall prior probability of this is, um, uh, is 0.25. And so I think. I think that was 0.125. I can't possibly I did something wrong. I think I think I did this wrong. Somehow that's the current probability. I didn't have the other part. The prior probability matters, but if you make a mistake, which is why I did it. And I'm sure I did it right there. I double checked myself on that. So anyway. Um, there's a 25% chance that the monkey wants to, that the monkey wants to go down left, um, and then you could continue to fill it out for all eight possibilities. So that's how. So this table is giving you, generically speaking, this term: the probability of a given firing rate if the monkey wants to go a certain direction. You want to know the overall prior probability of particular directions since we have eight of them, and there's no and there's no prior information. It's going to be 1 8 for each of those. And then down here, in this case, I tell you that the prior probability of 4 hertz is 0.22. So that, and, then, and then you just do base theorem eight times, um, where now you're getting, so that, like I said, the table gives you this. And then you want to calculate the reverse term, which is probability of a particular direction given the fire rate. Does that help a little bit with that? Yeah, I think I was I was confused on um, the second term in the numerator, like so I knew you would um, the, multiply. This, yeah. I just didn't know it would be one eight. Yeah, yeah. So um, so in um, if there are eight different um, if there are eight different possibilities, yeah. Uh, if there yeah if there are in different possibilities and we have um, yeah that, that, okay. and um, no reason to to think in advance that one of them is more likely than another than. Yeah, sure. Um, can you go over the like, classifiers and like, the errors and like, why would you choose the experiment with the classifiers and errors? The experiment with the like the, the, the one with the peach and the apple from the exam? Or? Um, no, it was like with, I think it was like with monkeys and like um, different classifiers and why one classifier is preferred to another one. Yeah, um, I mean, I think this was kind of similar to the peach apple thing in the exam, but I'll try and find the, um, let's see, um, oh, um, so, let's see, uh, topics, no, where is it, unit four notes, maybe it's one, of, yeah, it's probably somewhere, somewhere in this, um, Um, so, um, so essentially, um, we can sort of abs take, take recordings from a neuron, where we record some activity in the neuron, and convert that into times when the action potential happens. And then, if we record from a neuron over and over and over again, when we show an animal the same thing, again and again and again and again and again, then we'll maybe get some different responses out. So this is one example of converting some action potentials into just some points in time, right? That makes sense? And then if we do it, if we if we do this ten times, we'll get ten different trades of action potentials, which we convert can convert into ten different sequences of instants in time where there's a stop. Right? Then we go and we can say, okay, let's 
rather than having continuous time, we can break our time into chunks and just say, did, did, did an action potential happen or not in a certain chunk of time? So this might be a one or two millisecond wide chunk of time. So like in this two milliseconds, was there a spike, yes or no? Next two milliseconds, was there a spike, yes or no? Next two milliseconds, was there a spike, yes or no? But zeros and ones. And so we can convert these 10 sequences of spikes that I drew over these pages into these 10 sequences of zeros and ones. And so that is telling us now, what that means is when we show a particular stimulus, it could be a visual stimulus, it could be we play a song or a tune, um, it could be we touch the animal on a particular spot in its arm, Whatever we do, when we do that sensory input, this is what the sensory neuron gives us out in action potentials. And we convert that into something a computer can work with. Does that make sense so far? Then we do something else. Maybe the last time I was rubbing the animal's skin and this time I'm tapping it once. Or maybe, I think the example here is something about, yeah, that the first time I was showing it apples and I saw those, those sort of like, those things, those were the sequences I saw for apples. Here and now I'm showing it peaches, and when I show it peaches, then the sequences of action potentials I get for apples and peaches are this, and so I can just line them up side by side. The order doesn't really matter, but the point being just that this is sort of the distribution of kinds of things this neuron, kinds of firing patterns this neuron has when the animal sees an apple, and this is the distribution of kinds of firing patterns the neuron makes when the animal sees a peach, in, converted into these binary strings of when the action potential happens and when there are no action potentials. Does that make sense so far? So, um, <clears throat> so then I say, okay, well then I grab a mystery fruit, and um, the mystery fruit gives me this sequence of action potentials. And so there are two features that we've been talking, that we talked about in class that you might pay attention to. Um, one is the rate, and if you keep your length of time constant, then the rate is the same thing as the number of spikes. Um, and then the other is the timing, is the is the timing patterns. And timing patterns is a little bit more. There are a little bit more sort of subdivisions in timing patterns. Um, timing patterns could be, um, it could be time of the first spike, which um, we would call the latency. Um, it could be the interval between spike, between the first spike and the second spike. Um, it could be something a little bit more abstract, like um, the, the frequency, the, 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 um, yeah, the frequency of seeing two spikes close together in time, or it could be like, you know, the just time of every spike in the whole train, which is sort of, if you know the time of every spike in the train, then you can deduce the rest of these. That's the sort of most universal, but also in a lot of ways sort of most useless because you haven't distilled it down into something you can talk meaningfully about. Does that kind of make sense? Maybe. So to sort of make that a little bit more concrete, the way I constructed these examples here is um, whenever there's apples, the spikes often clump together, especially at the end um, of, the, of the end we'll see the apple. So that's a timing feature. Um, with the peach, I think I constructed it so there's never any times where you get two spikes close together. So if you are using timing as a way to classify whether it's an apple or a peach, then you would look for pairs of spikes close together. Um, 
if you're using, on the other hand, you can use rate. And so for rate, we just count them up. And so, um, so this time, four, four, three, four, five, three, five, four, four, three. So mostly fours with a couple fives and threes is sort of what we see for Apple. And then this is four, four, three, four, five, four, four, three, five, four. So in this case, again, mostly fours with a few fives and threes. And so in this example, um, the, um, the, the number of spikes is actually not so helpful for us because in both cases, we have about the same distribution. I could construct, I could have changed it such that maybe Apple, in addition to having spikes come in pairs, also has on average fewer spikes. And so in that case, a rate-based classifier would say that fewer spikes mean Apple's more spikes mean each, um, or vice versa. Um, in, this, in this example from the notes, I just has designed it so that the rate, rate was actually useless in that example. Um, and so the only thing you can do if you're looking to figure out what the fruit is, is just if there are spikes clumped together, you call it an apple. If there's no spikes clumped together, you call it a peach. Because the rate is sort of, does not by design, useless in that example. Um, we could create other examples where there's no distinct timing feature and rate is the only thing that's meaningful. Um, or other examples where the most relevant thing is when the time of the first spike is, or how close together the first two spikes are, or whatever. Um, and so, um, you know, you should be able to, to figure out, given something like this, um, like we've said already, um, whether or not there's a difference in the rates on average, and then, and then, so that'll tell you whether whether rate is going to be informative or not, and what rate is going to indicate, and then what timing patterns you see that differ between the two, and that tells you whether or not timing is informative, and then what timing features are actually useful or not. Does that help with that? Was that that was the questions you were that was the, that was the ones you were thinking about with that? Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Other questions. set the record for the shortest review I've ever had. Yeah, it's up. Vectors, yeah. Um, so, um, number one rule of vectors is you find the preferred direction for the neuron, and that's the direction your vector points. It can be negative, in which case it's going to go the opposite direction, but it's never going to go off at an angle. It's never going to be 90 degrees off. It's never going to be tilted. It's always going to be in the preferred direction of that neuron or opposite. Um, and so, um, I mean, so I guess you know, it was basically the last two class periods. I kind of worked through and some extended examples about vectors. Um, is there something in particular, some some like point in that that you want me to sort of jump into a little bit to help? Um, I think figuring out what is the preferred direction. Yeah. Um, and then figuring out what is the preferred direction. If it's not given to you. Oh yeah, sure. Um. So. So um, in, in all of the homework and pre-released exam questions and everything, um, I had the preferred direction being. So, uh, north, south, east, or west. Um, but, but it could be anything. And so we have some neuron P. Um, and neuron P has baseline firing rate equal to, say, 5 hertz. So if the animal doesn't want to move at all, then this neuron is 5 hertz. 
And then um, if the animal wants to go to the right, this neuron goes up to 10 hertz. The animal wants to go uh, diagonally up into the right, goes up to 15 hertz. It wants to go straight up, the neuron goes up to 10 hertz. Um, over here, 5 hertz. Over here, 5 hertz. Um, straight down, 2.5 hertz. Straight left, 2.5 hertz. And then down and to the left. Neuron self spiral scale. So, what's the preferred direction of that neuron? So, in other, the, by definition, the preferred direction is the direction that the animal can move that gets the neuron firing the fastest. Right, correct. Yeah, exactly. Preferred direction is a 45 degree angle effect. Um, it's not more informative and useful. In, in, in fact, neurons can have preferred directions anywhere. Um, it's simpler for me to just have all of my neurons either be up, down, left, or right. So on the assignment I gave you, they're all up, down, left, or right. But if I don't tell you what the preferred direction is, then it's just whichever direction gets the neuron firing the most. Um, on the homework and the, or the exam questions that I pre-release, um, that preferred direction is always, it happens to be um, one of the four cardinal directions because it makes life easier. But in this case, this neuron's vectors would always point diagonally. Or if they were negative, then they would be diagonal the other way. And we still would add them to other neuron's vectors exactly the same as we do with others where we just go head to tail and add them together. Um, in previous years, um, it turns out that, that there are some other complications that come in with population vector averaging when you have, that, that, that only become apparent when you start to consider neurons that are off of this um, uh, cardinal direction stuff. Um, so, once it gets to be 10 o'clock and everybody else leaves, if you want to stick around and talk about other problems, then we can definitely do that. But um, for right now, uh, the, the answer to your question is the preferred direction is just whatever direction gets to the run fire the most. And then that is going to be the direction all the vectors on this point. Unless they're negative and then they go the opposite. But they never go away. So this neuron, for example, is never going to give us a, a, a vector like this. Or never going to give us a vector like that. Because its preferred direction is to have this good act. Yeah, sure. So how is um, vector drawing or like vectoring more accurate or a better way to compute than like Bayes theorem? Yeah, so in a sense it's worse because um, in fact Bayes theorem is um, people who know better, who know more math than me assure me that Bayes theorem is the best you can possibly do in calculating something given because it literally takes into account all information and properly weights it. Um, so, in a sense, it's worse, but um, if you've begun to work through this problem here, question number two, um, with one neuron, it turns out to be a giant pain in the butt to calculate the probabilities of different directions. And then you take the, 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 the result of this becomes your prior knowledge when you start to consider neuron B. And so then it's a giant pain in the butt twice. Um, and in fact, this is even a simplified pain in the butt because there's some zeros in here which makes life easier. In reality, there's basically never zeros. There's maybe things with low probability, but never zeros. And so it becomes a computational nightmare, even for a pretty decent computer, to keep track of hundreds of neurons doing Bayes theorem on all of them. And if you just assign at any instant in time, you make each neuron represented by a single vector rather than a distribution of many probabilities. So another way to say this is Bayes theorem, at any moment in time, a neuron is represented by a distribution of many probabilities. And the overall conclusion is going to be the maximum of the joint distribution of all those hundreds of neurons, individual probabilities which requires a lot of computation. 
um, it is computationally much simpler to represent each of your 100 neurons as a single vector at any point in time, and then add those vectors together. And then is that like the preferred direction when you add it? Um, well, that's going to be the, the 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 goal is to get them is to get the intended direction. So we're trying to read the monkey's mind and get the intended direction of the person's mind and get the cursor to move where the animal or person wants it to go. Um, the best way to read their mind is to do this is to represent each neuron as a cloud of probability given by its by Bayes theorem, and then. Um, combine those clouds into joint probabilities that has some peak somewhere and that's where we move. But um, for a lot of computers, if you have a couple hundred neurons that you're dealing with, um, between the time the person wants to move the cursor and the time the cursor actually stops moving might be three seconds. Which isn't terrible, but if it took three seconds from when I did this and my screen moved, I would get really annoyed pretty quickly. Um, and so it's computationally much faster to represent each neuron as a vector. It's got a single direction. It's just changing in, in, in uh, size at any moment in time. And you, get a, you don't get quite as good an, a, 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 an estimate of where the person or monkey intends the cursor to move. Um, because, and part of the reason you don't get quite as good an estimate is because neurons are nonlinear and your population vector algorithm assumes that they're linear. Bayes' theorem, by definition, actually intrinsically accounts for the non accounts for the nonlinearities. It gets built into the calculations. Um, that's a little bit of a complicated discussion as to why, but if you know the probabilities of all of different firing rates and all the different intended directions, then then um, then the um, then um, any nonlinearities inherent in the neurons are going to be built into the probabilities of them firing different rates. Um, so Bayes' theorem, you're going to have initially less frustration because you're not missing the target as often, but more frustration because it's slow. So what we do is we have something that works you know, well enough, but kind of not so accurate in terms of the population vector algorithm, but it's fast early on. And then we let the person play with it for a while until they get there, until somehow, we don't know quite how, the person or the monkey or the mouse or whatever makes its neurons start being linear, like the vector algorithm assumes that they are. Raises the baseline firing rate so there's more space for encoding negative movement, negative directions. Um, how biophysically, biologically, biochemically that happens, we don't know. But somehow, when we plug the animal's brain into a computer that assumes it has linear neurons, over time those neurons start to become linear. And then our vector algorithm all of a sudden gets as good as anything else because the brain that it's connected to has figured out how to work it. Um, is this the closed so, loop? That's what, exactly, this closed loop. So closed loop means, yeah, that you let the person or monkey or whatever see what the computer thinks, and then see themselves not get to the target. And then somehow, they're like, well, I almost got there, but not quite. And somehow that I almost got there, but I'm not quite feeling gets converted into neuroplasticity makes the neurons now start to behave like the vector algorithm wanted them to in the first place. So you, so you get a fast but dumb algorithm, and the brain, um, and, and, and it keeps being fast, right? Your algorithm keeps being fast, but it starts being less dumb once the brain has rewired itself to start working the way it expects. And that is maybe not I mean, you, you, there are debates people have about whether, whether um, that is, is or is not the best way to go about things, but that's certainly one way to solve the problem of, um, of trying to make a neuroprosthetic device is to um, let the brain of the subject do a lot of the work of um, and, and is, is maximizing speed in your algorithm, which the vector, which the vector math does, um, and then letting the person's 
brain do the hard work of getting its neurons properly aligned to match what the, what the computer's been programmed to expect. Um, even though you know going in that the, the, what you expect is only an approximation of the reality, the neurons change to match your expectations, and then all of a sudden the reality of the neural coding does start to match what you'd originally expected. Does that kind of make sense? It's a weird, it's a weird logic, but yeah, you, you let the person's brain rewire itself to, to fix the problem. Yeah? I feel like you probably already so after you use the Bayes theorem, to yeah. like the probability, like how do you know which, like how would that? Um, um, so so for any decoding system, the um, whether it's a perception or a motor control, um, at the end of the day, once you've run Bayes theorem on all of the information you have, then you just say whatever's the most likely. That's what I'm going to do. So, um, so in this case, um, there are eight possible directions. Mm -hmm. After we run through, I think we run through two iterations of Bayes' theorem. With, um, no, okay, yes, I may, I may you only work through one iteration of Bayes' theorem, and then I say, um, and then I say, okay, and then I just ask you how much information you gain. Um, so you still have some probability distribution. But at the end of the day, you are going to have to move the cursor. And where you move the cursor is just in the direction of the highest probability. So, so because we are, with Bayes' theorem, we're asking what is the probability of, of possible movement one given firing rate, and then the probability of possible movement two, given the firing rate, um, and on and on and on and on, probability of possible movement, so n. So if there are 10 different ways that I might want to move, then I have to do 10 different times. You tell me the firing rate, I calculate the probability of all of them, and then, um, and then when you tell me, okay, now, now done with calculations, you got to move the cursor. Where are you going to move it? You move it in the direction of whatever's got the peak part of them. Okay, so for, like, if the neuron is firing at 4 hertz, like, for the easy question, um, isn't it equal probability? Yeah, that one does work out yeah, being equal right. probability. Um, so, we're, we're and so, the you'd prob in that case, you'd flip a coin between being up left or up right, I okay. guess, is what you'd be. Because, and, and, and legitimately, that kind of makes sense because um, it turns out that we have no, that there's no, it's no more likely to do that in either of those directions. It's sort of like if I tell you in this sub problem here, in this situation here, I say the neuron's firing 10 hertz. And if that's all the information I give you is one neuron firing 10 hertz, you don't know whether you want to go up or right. So, so in that case, you might have, and then you might, and if, if I forced you to make a movement, you'd have to flip the point between. Um, if I give you a second neuron, which I think I have you work, I think I have you in question three. Let me look. What did I write in question three? It's been a while since. Um, so you record from two neurons. Um, oh no. Yeah. I guess I don't know. Maybe it's just in. Um, Yeah, maybe it's just maybe it's just in here where I say um, uh, where where we sort of compare. Um, I guess I don't have to because we never talked about good doing base theorem multiple times. I mean, there's more and more. Where we sort of barely talked about it at all. Um, but if you have multiple neurons, then at some point one thing becomes more probable than others. But ultimately, when you're classifying something, either classifying something as a as as a as an uh, as an estimate of where you're, of where the animal was being touched, or if you're classifying something as an intention that the animal has, either way, you're going to go with the map, whatever whatever of your list of possibilities, whichever one's the most likely, that's the one you're going to go with. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess, and in some cases, you might have a tie, and then you just say, okay. Have, we, either, we either don't have enough to finally answer it, or we just have to go with one or the other and, and, and you know, like that. Yeah, sure. 
in our vector calculations, is there going to be a unit for the length? Um, so, um, yeah, I, I glossed over this and I just kind of shouldn't have. Um, so, um, what we really should do is, um, is, when we, is when we add the vectors together, we should also, or actually, sorry, when we convert fire rate to vectors, then we should multiply it by centimeters so that our units become centimeters per second so that they become units of velocity. Because we ultimately want it to, the length of our vector to encode the speed at which the cursor is moving. Um, so, um, so, I think I talked about them originally as dimensionless, and if you just want to think of them as dimensionless, that's fine. There's one problem where the speed is sort of tied up in there. Um, you can think of them as dimensionless but proportional to speed, or if you want, if it's easier to attach dimensions to them, then you just say multiply by centimeters, and so you have centimeters per second. Um, so if we have like two vectors, and we find the resultant vector, yeah. we use like the Pythagorean theorem, we find the length um, well, I don't think I ever ask you, I think the most I ever ask you is fast or slow. Okay. And I don't ever ask you on this, and since this is all the questions. Um, but yes, you would, um, you would add them together, find the length of the resultant vector, and then actually, since we're averaging rather than adding, you would divide by a scalar, which is the number of um, inputs. Um, but that ends up not mattering for these questions that we've got here. Um, yeah, if you if you if you got all of that and that makes life easier for you to think about it like that, great. Um, if you prefer to think of the vectors as dimensionless and just eventually trying to find the direction and that the length is somehow proportional to the speed of movement, then that's fine. Yeah. I mean, we've been going for 45 minutes. I'm, I'm here as late as you all want to be, but um, if, uh, you know, if, you've got all, if you've had all of your questions answered, then uh, you're welcome to, to, to stick around and take off anytime you like. Yeah, sure. Sometimes I will check, just to be extra safe, but the final is Tuesday at 5, right? 5.30, I think. Okay. Whatever the register is. Whatever the yes, register is. Okay. And okay. we're in Baker? I, I think so. It's, it's go 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 to the hub, and in here. Let's, why don't we just, just Tuesday, not tomorrow, right? It, yeah, that's 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 what I have on my calendar. Um, yeah, it is Tuesday. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Let's. Um, uh, it is open notes. It's open five thirty. Yeah, open notes, open laptop, open... In Baker A51. Yeah. Does um. open laptop mean open internet or... No, no. Okay. You Wi-Fi off, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you need to already come with everything downloaded on your computer, all of the notes from the class, all of the research articles that have been posted on Blackboard. Basically, download everything that we've got on Blackboard onto your computer. So we're allowed to have them, like... Yeah, and, and yeah, you can have you can print or any, anything you can physically carry, including a hard drive um, with whatever's on it. Um, so yeah, you can download everything from Blackboard, all of my lecture slides, all of the exams, answer keys, um, um, everything, the whole business. Just uh, just yeah, download, download, download it all. Um, Um, so, yeah, we are, molecules to mind, 5.30 to 8.30, Baker Hall, A51. A53 is a little bit smaller. I don't know why they always assign them as a, we'll just be an A51. So.
like which set of neurons like the quickly or slowly we use to to draw the vectors? Um, well, so again, they have the same preferred direction. So neuron A, for example, preferred direction is right in both cases. So neuron A is always oh. going to have a right vector. And so the point of this is that actually, as you do the vector math, these ambiguities about direction and speed get solved automatically when you do the vectors right. It's sort of what you should get to. Anyway, I'll stick around as long as anybody wants.